I swear to God, this thing's not recording. Okay, and welcome back to the Constitution Podcast. I'm your host, Chad White. If you didn't know, the Premier Podcast website, seabuscomedy.com. Like I just said, it's a website. Go there. It's episode 146 of the Constitution Podcast. Uh, listen, <laughs> this is the third time I have tried to do this godforsaken intro. Uh, I moved my laptop, and the uh, the I, I guess there's some type of loose mechanism inside of the... And I've been dealing with this problem for years. There's some loose mechanism. There's a side of the microphone, which I think is the microphone, because uh, I'm using the USB version. It's not a version of the microphone. I'm using the USB style. There's an XLR part in the bottom of the microphone. And I don't have an XLR-equipped machine to record. Anyway, sometimes if the, if the connection on both the laptop, on either the laptop or the... Uh, uh, whatchamacallit, the Yeti, that go loose, then the microphone stops recording. And Audition doesn't recognize it, and it switches back to the laptop's microphone. And I have been dealing with this for the past, I would say, three minutes. I've done three different starts for this stupid show. Let's bump up to five, because I've been dealing with it. And it's very frustrating. <laughs> One day, I will be able to uh, buy a Zoom H6, but I know as soon as I buy one of those, it's gonna there's gonna be an H9 that comes out. That's even better. All right, we're doing this. Uh, let's get into the constitutional. So I know there's a lot of stuff, and I know that I did not read most of it. <laughs> um, new show on Fox, Animation Domination. It's a show called Duncanville, starring uh, Amy Poehler, Ty Burrell. And a few other people. It's an animated cartoon series coming from um, Amy Poehler's Paper Kite Productions. She plays two characters, the mom of the main character and the main character himself as well, uh, with a slight variance in her voice <laughs> Just a, a, for both characters. Uh, it's a very funny show. It, and it also comes from the animation studio that is behind Bob's Burgers called Bento Box. I, I enjoy it more so than I enjoyed Bless the Hearts. <laughs> And if Bless the Hearts got a season two, then surely Duncanville will get a season two. It stars a, a kid who is a teenager, just learning to drive, and he has a crush on a character played by, played by Rashida Jones. She's a hardcore feminist. Betsy Sidaro's in the show, some other people. Very funny. I urge you to check it out. Also check out uh, the show called Love is Blind. Um, and it's Netflix's second dating show in as little as a couple of weeks. It's a reality show, reality dating show. And I usually don't watch this stuff, <clears throat> but it is, I watched the first episode of the circle thinking it was going to be a reality experiment, a social experiment. Circle is, uh, so there are two different shows. So the circle is people who are put into an apartment by themselves. And the only way they can communicate with people is by social a social network called The Circle. And there's 10 of them, 8 to 10 people. I think it got to, it got to be like 12 or something. Uh, I only watched the first two episodes. Uh, for a reason, I'll get into that in a second. But there's 8 to 12 of them. And they can either lie about who they are or they can tell the truth. Uh, it's, very inter- it's very interesting when it's put that way. But then eventually is made into a pseudo dating show. And I got so frustrated during that second episode when it turned into a dating show, which it wasn't, it wasn't meant to be a dating show, obviously, but uh, when it did turn into a dating show, I had to look up the ending because it already ended by the time I started watching. And I thought, I don't care about this. I want it to be, because the person who won ended up dating another person on the show. And I, I just wanted to be a social experiment. If I want a dating show, I would watch Love is Blind, which I have started. And that show, I think it was shot in Chicago and Atlanta. These people, they go into a room. They're able to talk to others, but they can't see the person that they're on a date with. And then at the end of 10 days, you have to decide if you want to marry that person. If you want to marry that person, you have to plan your wedding. And then and obviously you meet them after you are, uh, after you ask them to marry you. <laughs> it's so stupid. <laughs> and then you plan your wedding and then you meet the families and you do this all in a matter of 10 days. 
that is a that is a wonderful concept for a TV show. <laughs> there's I don't want to get too deep into this. We're already five minutes in to the session. But there's one part in the first episode, so I'm not ruining anything, where one couple they <laughs> they they acknowledge that they've only known each other for a total of five hours. Like they go on they've gone on, you know, f- a couple of dates. They've only talked to each other like twice. And then they both go, I love you. <laughs> The woman goes, I love you. He goes, I love you too. She goes, I love you. She screams. She puts her hands in her face. (laughs) And I guess it's some form of love. But there are true dichotomies. And this is what I wrote here in my notes. There are dichotomies of the two shows. One one is a pure dating show. uh, And it's built around that concept. But then the other, which is a circle, it's not. And now they have to weave a narrative. Obviously, it's reality. So you can weave a narrative, whatever you want. But when it turns into that, it just gets less interesting because you have to kick people off like survivor. I've never seen an, an inch of it. <laughs> I've never seen a second of survivor and I've never seen a second of the amazing race, but those aren't dating shows. Now, if it's survivor and, or if it's the amazing race and your partner is somebody you're in love with, you've never mentioned that to them. <laughs> and then for some reason you guys are in Singapore looking for a golden puzzle piece to put on the top of Machu Picchu. I know those are two different, two different areas of the world. I understand. Uh, but if you're doing that and then you finally decide to tell that person, <laughs> I mean, that's, <clears throat> that's where it comes from. But now, uh, but the circle turning into a dating show, it was a social experiment. Now it's a dating show. It's, oh, it's a whole thing. Um, I enjoyed my f- first episode with it so far. I'm two episodes into love is blind one. I'm watching one a day and, uh, you know what? It's, it's ridiculous, but <laughs> And there's one guy, never mind. The guy named Barnett on there is a piece of trash. Um, all right, so let's get, let's get, let's move on to this stuff because I got there's a lot of stuff to talk about. And there's three things I really want to talk about. Mike Bloomberg, Mike Bloomberg is paying for his memes and the idea is backfiring. So Mike Bloomberg obviously is pouring $400 million, I think, into which is one, I think it's like he's worth, no, Jeff Bezos is worth $142 billion. Um, Anyway, it's something crazy like he's pouring like 1 or 2% of his money, like 200 million to 400 million dollars into ad campaigns just so he can uh get on this um ballot. Anyway, uh Mike Bloomberg was in the debate last night. Great debate. He got crapped on. It was amazing. My girl Elizabeth Warren is in there. Uh we all know who I am for. It's Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> I don't think anybody knew that. Anyway, uh go Warren. I think Bernie bros are just as bad as Trump's people. So for you take that as what you will. This is from Sharon Gahaf Gafari. Excuse me. That was really bad. I should not have said that Sharon Gafari Bloomberg's Instagram meme ad campaign is backfiring. So essentially what, ha- what has happened is that Mike has hired a bunch of ad influencers, social influencers on Instagram and he is paying them to make memes out of his name, out of Mike Bloomberg. So people can, the people who are voting, you know, in these upcoming primaries can get out and vote for him. <laughs> it's so stupid. And the idea is not, it's uh, people are just making fun of him instead. <laughs> in recent days, several influential Instagram accounts like F Jerry, you know, the one that put on the fire festival that are known for sharing viral content, some of its advertisers and uh, some of it by advertisers and some of it not, started posting memes that build a, quote, self-aware, ironic character for the candidate. As the New York Times first reported, the memes, which are labeled in the captions and uh, in the captions as advertisements are visible to some 60 million followers who follow the, these influencer accounts. Um, <laughs> this is so stupid. Oh, this is so dumb. And basically, he's just trying to—he's trying to get the younger people out. He's trying to do what Bernie and I guess Pete. Do young people like Pete? I know gay people want Pete to be a little bit gayer. I read something about that on—I don't know if it was New York Mag or New Yorker. I think it was New Yorker. Uh, I might be wrong. <laughs> I'm not gonna look it up though. But these meme things are backfiring. Mike Bloomberg is pouring way too much money into this campaign. But he—I mean—it's working. He's now polling at number three or something like that. Something crazy behind. Bernie and Pete. This is not the um, the, the political podcast, but <laughs> I could talk about this stuff all the time because I I mean this is the stuff I'm into. This business, video games, movies, <laughs> movie news. 
that's not that's what I'm into, baby. Listen, I want to I want to keep uh, barreling forward. How much? All right, got ten minutes on this section. Um, this is from Danny Deal from The Verge. Justin Bieber was accused of stealing a melody, but it's actually a royalty sample, a royalty free sample you can buy online. Okay, so there's a song off of Justin Bieber's new album called uh, Changes, and the song is called Running Over, and it's featuring Lil Dicky, who is having it, who has his own FX show for some reason. I don't know why. I don't understand. Why is it? You know what? I don't want to crap on somebody. Anyway. So the album, which is fine. Although I listened to Anthony Fantano on YouTube, the the busiest music nerd on the internet. And he didn't like it. But that's just one person. I thought it was fine. I listened to it twice last Friday, so. <laughs> I think it was back to back. No, I listened to it when I was in the shower and then I got to work and then I listened to it again. This means nothing to nobody. <laughs> I like changes. And you know, also, he's sp- Justin Bieber is spending a week at the Late Late Show with James Corden. And I watched them do uh, carpool karaoke and then toddlerography, which is toddlers uh, making up choreography. And they did it to Justin Bieber's baby. And it was the cutest video. I think I like Justin Bieber. And he just seems like a nice guy. I have nothing wrong with him. I'm in a, I am in a mood where I just don't want to make fun of anybody. I don't think any, especially, I mean, I've, I'd never make fun of Justin Bieber, uh, because he was a child when he first started this stuff and he didn't deserve ridicule and, and he still doesn't. Um, but now he's, he's a nice guy. He's grown into a, a nice guy. There's nothing wrong with him. I mean, I mean, obviously, you know, <laughs> I don't know his you know, personal life, but he loves his wife. He wants to make music and he's just being him. So, you know, kudos to you. So this song running over sounds a lot like a song called synergy. Artist Asher Monroe pointed out that the soft and plucky hook in the 2019 and his 2019 song synergy is the same one in running over. So we will play the hook. I'll play it for a couple of seconds. I don't want to get context right here on the YouTube. Um, so that's, Oh no. Okay. Hold on. I want to get a context right. This is going to be silly. All right. So there's that. And then here's synergy. So obviously it's the same thing. This isn't like those, uh, what was that? That Katy Perry one, the the lawsuit she lost against that Christian rapper who said that the, the, uh, there's a melody in, uh, an ET that sounded a lot like his song and it did not. Uh, he was wrong. I, I side with Katy Perry on that one, but Sp- uh, splices online marketplace this is from, uh, Ms. No, I forgot who wrote this. Danny. <laughs> yeah. Danny. <laughs> This comes from Danny. Splice is an online marketplace where music makers can buy samples and use to use their royalty fr- to use royalty free in their own songs, alleviating licensing and copywriting risks. So maybe I can play that on YouTube. The company works with renowned producers to create sample tracks for the platform, including Andres and Marcuccio, the duo behind Smash Hit Despacito. Okay, uh, so the sample that Bieber and Monroe can be found in a pack that British musician Lax City made for Splice's website. So, although both songs use the same melodic sample, no one is copying anyone. There you go. Uh, you just, you gotta understand. You gotta understand. Not everybody's stealing from everybody. Sometimes things are just as simple. There's a simple answer like that. And obviously you didn't know what those type, what those uh, things were. But, I mean, Whatever. This last, this last one for this first part of this episode. Oh, Jesus. I clicked on... It's so weird. iPad stuff is so weird where you can't you can't click on some stuff in some Google documents and it won't take you directly to... I don't know what I just said. So YouTube... This seems like something I should have done for news time, but I forgot. YouTube turned... <laughs> uh, was it 15? Yeah, 15. Last week. YouTube is 15 years old. Um... You know, I do have a YouTube episode that's planned. Actually, it's a YouTube music episode. And I planned it, I want to say 2018, when we learned that YouTube music was, was Google Play Music was going to become YouTube music. I planned it out. And I'm still waiting for the switch. <laughs> so, but this happened last week, and last week was the NBA All-Star episode. So, you know, if you didn't need to watch that one. <laughs> I get really good views on Instagram but but the YouTube it doesn't translate to YouTube sometimes I'll get someone comment 
<laughs> Welcome to the XFL episode of News Time. Someone commented. <laughs> okay, let's get on. Uh, so YouTube started in 2005, and it just used to be this place where it, it was like the Wild Wild West, where you had three or five minute limits or something like that. Because I remember I, I was I've been watching YouTube since the beginning, and and everything was in this low 360p and uh i think lazy yeah they have they have lazy sunday up here uh lazy sunday was was uploaded for the first time that's oh my gosh um but this comes from gizmodo written by matt novak here's what people thought of youtube when it first launched in the mid 2000s so it started and mashable this comes from mashable this is so the the Gizmodo piece is referencing Mashable. YouTube is way ahead of a, of many of these other services. YouTube videos are appearing on blogs and websites all over the place. Our media is also excellent, but it's a nonprofit. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but the only viewer video sharing service with a clear business model right now is Rever. They're putting ads in videos and splitting the revenue with a content creator. Oh my gosh! In 2005. Um, but yeah, I mean, things were just uploaded to YouTube in 2005. Uh, eventually, like I said, it used to be Wild West. Eventually, there's a thing called the Content ID, which is what the, a tool they use now. But they started in 2007, and it would scan videos to see what was copyrighted and what wasn't. Um, it's it wasn't as heavy as it was back then because you could have you, people used to upload full episodes. This is how. Uh, I started watching Conan stuff because Andy, my vest in the closet fell off the hook. I was looking out of the ground. I mean, it's been off. I, obviously, it fell at some point during the day. Uh, anyway, or maybe someone came in my home and started wearing my stuff. <laughs> okay, I got to finish this. Um, but I remember Andy um, Richter's, one of Andy Richter's shows, uh, which was called Andy Richter P.I., Andy Barker P.I., and and he has another show called um, Andy Controls the Universe, and he upload and uh, someone uploaded you know episodes of those shows in like five minute increments. So you would see like part one, and then you know part two, like Andy Richter episode one part one, and that's how things used to be done. And then I remember when they added in that limit of twenty minutes, and then or and it just went it just went higher, and now it's essentially unlimited. Uh, then there are lawsuits and stuff like that, or the threat of lawsuits, because, you know, shows would just be uploaded. <laughs> and then it's basically, they're just trying to moderate for dirty stuff. Then Google bought, announced it was purchasing YouTube for $1.65 billion in stock in 2006. Holy cow. Holy crow. Google had its own video service at the time, known as Google Video, which eventually folded. Like most of the stuff they do. 2008. So many things happened. Uh, go read this piece. Uh, it, 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 it does a really good job of uh, chrono, chrono, chronicalizing <laughs> chronology <laughs> for this for YouTube. Uh, listen, I'm going to take a break. I'm going to turn on this other camera and we'll come back. we got three great things to talk about. <laughs> Two, one. And we're back to the show. Welcome back to the show. I'm vamping because I don't have my headphones on. We're back. <laughs> I yesterday. Today's Wednesday. No, today's Thursday. Oof, Jesus. I was so excited <laughs> for this week to not be over. No, I want it to be over. Um, it's cold outside. This is where, I, if you're watching the video, I'm still wearing a jacket. I have my sweater, my shirt, and my tie still on. And my sweater. But yeah, I have a sweater under this jacket. I have a jacket, sweater, shirt, and tie. <laughs> also, it's cold in here, obviously, because of the brick. And it's cold. And I have hardwood floors and tile in the main room. Um, but on Tuesday, I did legs, as I usually do. And to cap off my workout, I did my hip abductors and my adductors on those machines, the leg machines. And I do this every couple of weeks. But when I do it, I do like 250 pounds. <laughs> Because I got strong inner thighs and outer thighs. Because I got these thick gams. And every single time, no matter how much I, no matter how much I stretch, no matter how much I have a foam roller, I got a, I got a little bar thing that I could roll over my legs. No matter how much I do all that stuff, my legs will still get tight. 
So I found some exercises or stretches <laughs> to do. I was going to do them at work. And then I realized I, had, I sit in an open office <laughs> and people already look at my, look at me because I sit on a ball, which did not help. It made it, it made things worse today. Sitting on that exercise ball, that med ball. Um, and it's very true. I do get like, I, I sit in an area where people can walk by where, where people always walk by. It's like the main road <laughs> and they can just look at my screen. And uh, nine times out of ten, if you look by this week, because I have not been had, I've not had a lot of work. Uh, I was watching Dragon Ball Super, but the thing is, I don't like it when people. I don't even like it when people look at me. Period. <laughs> so, if you're watching this, if you work with me, don't make eye contact. <laughs> don't look at my computer screen. <laughs> There's nothing for you there. Just me pretending to read Vox, the New York Times, <laughs> the New Yorker. And a Washington Post. This next story comes from Deadline, written by Peter White, my cousin. Viacom CBS is set to expand CBS All Access with House of Brands service as it looks to accelerate momentum in streaming. So Viacom CBS got its first results and it's from its fourth quarter fiscal 2019. And that was because they merged a while ago, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, they were not good. <laughs> Those numbers were not good. Um, the, the companies every quarter will report their earnings. And that will give investors, you know, either the either investors will say they'll see their earnings and they'll see the numbers go up or see what the, see what the company has to offer in the future. And they'll go, oh, this is good. Well, we'll invest more money or investors and analysts if they see it go down and there's nothing to offer in the future, then they'll go, Ooh, boy, I don't know if we should continue to support. So Viacom comes out. We don't have good numbers. However, we're going to make the streaming thing work. So Viacom, the company, owns BET, MTV, CMT, Comedy Central, uh, Bravo, VH1, and a couple of networks, I believe. And then they also own. Oh, and then CBS owns CBS All Ac- CBS proper, you know, CBS All Access, the streaming service, Pop TV, Showtime, and Pluto, the streaming service. So now that they're all together under one banner, what Viacom CBS wants to do is they want to offer free, broad pay. Those are their words, and premium pay offerings for streaming. So they so the free is essentially CBS and Pluto TV. And then the broad pay would be CBS All Access, which they want to build up to be a Viacom branded streaming service, much like your HBO Maxes, much like your Netflixes, and much like your Hulus. And then the premium pay would be Showtime. So they're, so they're going to find out a way to make CBS All Access be the the gateway. Now I don't know if that means because they had they did not specifically say that they're going and they're called it's an AVOD service. Uh, I'm excuse me, AV, I'm sorry, that's for a different thing. Excuse, just forget what I just said. No one knows if they're going to build off of the CBS All Access platform because they were the first streamer to do this, to gatekeep all their stuff, take it off of Netflix, take it off of Hulu, and then just say, hey, you got to get CBS All Access. But now you know, obviously, NBC, HBO, they're all following suit, <coughs> follow following suit. But they don't know. CEO Bob Backish did not tell tell stories if they were going to take CBS All Access and build from that platform and make it. You know, there's already some cartoon shows on there, some kids shows, Danger Mouse, Madeline, I believe, uh, and there's also some movies on there from the CBS brand. But they didn't say like single white female things on there. But they didn't say if they're going to have. Comedy Central shows on there or uh, MTV shows on there. Like, are you the one? No one knows. So we'll see probably next year at some point. And that's just my estimate. CBS All Access and Showtime, this is something you want to take away, have passed 10 million combined subscribers and are on track to hit internal targets of 25 million by 2022. 
CBS All Access, I think, is four dollars a month if you want ads, and ten dollars if you don't. There you go. We'll see what happens. Yeah, within the next year, I think that'll be within the next year. I think they want to see how Peacock is doing because because that's kind of a tiered service. Because if Pluto is the and obviously Pluto is a separate app, but if Pluto is the free thing, and then CBS All Access is the mid tier, and then Showtime is the premium. They're they're obviously that's they're tackling it in the same way that NBC's Peacock streaming service is, which is going to be free, mid tier, premium tier. Uh, there's another, okay, this is so stupid. <laughs> I saw a story. I want to glance over it. This is from uh, Vulture written by Nicholas Qua. Podcasting is getting its own Oscars. Will it work? <laughs> this is so stupid. So th- essentially last week, a group came together and they formed something called the podcast Academy, which is a very real thing. And they're trying to take it very seriously. And you can go to their website. I'll turn my iPad around. You can go to their website and look, I can palm this entire iPad. I've got giant hands. You can turn it, you can uh, go to the website. You can, uh, if you have a podcast, then you can throw in your submissions to be accepted. It's, it's, the website's never really built out. Uh, but they're described as a nonprofit organization dedicated to, quote, elevating awareness and excitement for podcasts as a major media category and advancing knowledge and relationships in and around the business. Now, I have always been jo- I've always been joking that podcasting needs to be regulated and we need to find out what's good, quote unquote, and what's bad. This I think this would be a good way to do this. Um it's this is and I I mean it doesn't it's not okay, well, let me read you who's a part of it. And then and then I'll discuss if I think it's a good idea. And I think it's a good idea. Uh, so whatever. Its founding members include executives from Wondery. Stitcher, NPR, PRX, Tenderfoot TV, Spotify, and Sony Music, along with criminals Lauren Sofer, Soferer, Spoke Media's Alia Tavakolian, UTA's Oren Rosenbaum, and Rekha Murthy, a former PRX exec tuned, turned independent operator. No one is just named John Smith, which is good. <laughs> Makes it hard for this, but it's good. Uh, one noteworthy thing, this is from uh, the Vulture again, about this story is that some major podcast publishers haven't declared an allegiance to the podcast uh, academy, which includes iHeartMedia, the New York Times, Intercom, Westwood One, and Luminary, which are the which are the names. I mean, I don't know if you want Luminary in there, but those are the names you want to hear, especially iHeartMedia and New York Times, which has The Daily, which is probably one of the most listened to podcasts out there. You, uh, there are pockets of skepticism, obviously, but every, there are some people accepting it. It's <laughs> okay. So when you put something in a box that is supposed to be, you know, really, I mean, it was a medium that was created in 2000, never not funny when that came out, 2007, something like that there. Cause they're 12 years old. So 2008, <laughs> so 2008. Um, and Nerdist as well too. And then Guy and Gal. And uh then a little bit of WTF. Um, and then a little bit after that comedy betting. But <laughs> when you have these things that you know only started nigh upon a decade ago, and no one's making money, you know, except for the mega popular ones. Uh and even then they're not making Buku Dolores. They just have a popular show. Um but when you have these things that are making, you know, this, this money and, and they're doing, and people around the world know the show and it's free to get into mostly, you know, mostly free to get into, it's going to be kind of tough because this, this isn't a regulation thing. This is more of a legitimizing thing. And if you want to legitimize podcasts, then you have to take it a little bit more seriously. And in, in a medium that's not inherently serious because it did start off of talk radio. It did start off of comedy podcasting. And now it's morphed into accepting more murder podcasts and criminal podcasts and true crime and news and meditation and all this other stuff and self-help and religion. So this is a tough thing to put up. And I mean, obviously, and then so just because it has these execs doesn't mean these companies are exactly 
going to help unionize. It's not going to help start a SAG for podcasting because that's impossible. I mean, at this point, it's impossible. I'll just kick the microphone. Uh, and then there, and then obviously, uh, Vulture writes the writer. Excuse me. Let me just go up and see the Nicholas Nicholas Qua. Nicholas Qua, you know, writes in a fascinating parallel to broader platform monopoly worries. These concerns about the the academy appear to be an expression of a more elemental fear. The power in podcasting, a format historically valued for its decentralized nature by which any creator could ostensibly build a following. This is a run on sentence and a building without and, and a business without having to negotiate with gatekeepers would be consolidated in the hands of a relative few by virtue of its academy. In other words, there exists some theoretical concern that the podcast academy represents the formation of a true gatekeeper. Um, and <laughs> And to dumb it down even further, because I just kind of got what he what he wrote. Um, basically, it would be if these people are saying, you know, if you even if I if I submit the constitutionals, which I wouldn't, but if I did, then and it got accepted, but then you know someone else's show didn't get accepted, and they're virtually the same show, or or they're basically saying, you know, all podcasts should be this way. They're saying all podcasts should be the daily. All podcasts should be WTF. And it can't be Culture Kings. It can't be Up First. Or the near, well, I mean, near Times Popcast. Yeah, it couldn't be all that stuff. But I don't think that's how the regular movie academy works or the music academy works. Because even, I mean, you know, save for the Grammys. But, <laughs> but if I'm in the, if I'm in the movie academy, uh, I mean, they have Terry Crews and he was in white chicks and they have Adam Sandler and he was in white. And he was in, uh, um, uh, uh, Oh God. When's that little Nicky? <laughs> I'm trying to think of an Adam Sandler movie that I really liked when I was younger. And then I stopped liking the only Adam Sandler movies I don't like are little Nicky. I don't think I can watch that again today. Uh, the one I really, the only truly, if I had, a, if there's, if there's only one Adam Sandler movie that I do not like. Um, although I haven't seen the ridiculous six, but whatever. I'll watch it at some point. There's one Adam Sandler movie I do not like, and it is Billy Madison. And people love that, and I don't understand why. <laughs> I do not like this movie. <laughs> but more power to you. I think it's him at his most yelly, and I think that is unfunny. But every other Adam Sandler movie, I enjoy. This last thing uh, comes from the BBC.com. Oh, we're coming in under time. This is written by Stephen Kelly. Now, this is why I, I saw this last Friday when I was uh, at home alone, not doing anything <laughs> from Sonic the Hedgehog to Star Wars or fans too entitled. This is a great little write up that I skimmed over um, that that talks about uh, fandom entitlement, essentially something I've been talking about for a long time. And it all harkens back to where a couple of months ago. I would say last summer, I believe, last spring, uh, or maybe last fall. Sonic the Hedgehog, they, they were, the Paramount or whoever <laughs> released a trailer for Sonic the Hedgehog, and it had a redesign of Sonic. Obviously, it didn't look good, but people came out of the woodwork and said, you know, these horrible things, <laughs> uh, and, you know, the memes and stuff, but more importantly, they raged against the machine. I hate saying that, but they raged against the machine. <laughs> that is the... Uh, the movie studio and the movie studio, you know, they took that feedback like gentlemen, like gentle ladies. They took that feedback. They went back. They, they redesigned it. And then they put out a Sonic the Hedgehog movie just last week on Valentine's day that a Sonic looked more like Sonic. But the thing is, then we, and then let's look at star Wars where this last movie it wasn't, I don't know, something happened. People didn't like it, I guess. And and now, you know, fans are in an uproar. Like, this is the worst thing. Game of Thrones, the last season, people didn't like it. Uproar, worst thing in the world. Fans are too... There's a thing called parasocial, parasocialism. And it's the reason why I stopped following a lot of stuff on the internet, which is why I don't buy a lot of things uh, that support, you know, a show or a movie. Like, I won't buy... Like, okay, for instance, I own a shirt a long time ago. I was a fan of uh, Donald Glover's Childish Gambino. And I bought a shirt and I went to a concert. I drove from my college to Athens, Georgia. Stayed with my friends at UGA. 
I drove down to the uh, playhouse down there, Variety Playhouse, I think that's what it's called. And I went, and I saw uh, Charles Gambino. I bought a shirt. I was so excited, $20. Went back to my friend's dorms. I was like, look at this shirt I got, it's great. Cut to, I think, like a year and a half later. Uh, he just didn't put out music, and I got tired of listening to the same stuff. Eventually got burned out, and, you know, I stepped back. I don't like, you know, I mean, I've now, you know, seven years later, I I, I can li- I can tolerate him now. But I can't, I, I just, for a long time, I couldn't listen to his music. It was just not good. <laughs> and, and uh, but there's a, but then... You know, for him, this is this is really, I shouldn't have mentioned him. I should have mentioned some internet stuff that I don't like anymore. Um, but for him, it was he used to make music for you know uh, guys like me, uh, middle class black kids. This is this is a line from him that I think about all the time, which is because it was a really good line. Um, first, uh, middle class black kids, middle class black kids who don't have a role model, because you know the lower class ones obviously they have sports players and the upper class ones they have the rich sports players uh so and so i had this and and now he's just it's kind of music for uh little white girls essentially <laughs> yeah you heard it from me folks <laughs> uh but anyway let me to finish the, to finish this out the fans are to per pair socialism where uh Fans think they're friends with the people that make the thing, and they believe that they can that they own everything that the person does, which they don't. I mean, I'm not putting it in a good term, but parasocialism is essentially that you like something a lot, somebody else uh, you like something a lot, uh, you hold on to it for dear life. <laughs> And when something that the people do doesn't go your way, then you throw a tantrum, essentially. Uh, the article refers to, in 1968, Star Trek fans, a group who essentially invented the framework for modern fandom, orchestrated a huge and successful letter-writing campaign to save the show from cancellation. Same thing happened to The Expanse in Brooklyn Nine-Nine. This is what I, uh, I'm reading the thing. Um, or, you know, it doesn't have to work for cancellations as well. Uh, if something happens in a show that people don't like, then they'll do petitions for it. Anyway, all this to say, go read it on BBC.com. Fans, trash. That being said, if you're a fan of C plus comedy, <laughs> you can have all this constitutional podcast, you can head over to the website, C plus comedy.com. Where there's uh, interviews. I'm trying to set one up right now. <sighs> God, this is one I've been thinking about for the past three years. And I tried two years ago. And I don't want to say anything more because I don't, because this part, because the person that emails me for this one doesn't usually get back to me. <laughs> so, <laughs> in fact, let me double check my email right now. <laughs> So if you want to, she emailed me. She said she'll check. She said she'll check. I'm so excited. I don't want to. I don't want to say the name of the person. Uh, so hopefully next week, maybe next week. And I've met this person in real life, so you know, this person won't remember the story. But <laughs> listen, if you like what you're here, seamlesscounty.com interviews and stuff. If you want to see a video version of this show where the last uh, five minutes are usually me looking at the GoPro on the desk because the DSLR has turned off. <laughs> Canons have a record limit of 17 minutes. Canon T3s have a record limit of 17 minutes. The newer Canons have a record limit of 30 minutes, but I have a T3 from 2005 or something like that. Whenever it came out, it's old. YouTube.com slash Evil's Comedy. See a video version of the show. As well as News Time. Which is, I don't know why I keep looking at that camera. <laughs> which is uh, the premiere the premiere show for Seabless Comedy.com. It's a weekly news show, like the Daily Show. Way, way less funny. I choose one story. And I talk about it for 7 to 13 minutes. Sometimes uh, 4 minutes. Sometimes 5 minutes. For the past couple of weeks, it's been like, 
seven minutes. Last week, I think it was 13. This week's episode is, I mentioned it earlier, uh, is the, the NBA All-Star History. Um, oh, <laughs> all right. DSLR just shut off. <laughs> NBA All-Star History. Next week's episode, I don't know. Oh, no, I haven't laid out. I know, I know it is. Okay, listen, I'm going to answer this email. I'm so excited. <laughs> Hopefully, this happens Monday because there's a timetable on when the thing happens, which is Wednesday. Because I want to get it out that Wednesday. Anyway. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Rate us. Apple Podcasts. Stitcher. Google Podcasts. Spotify. Thank you so much. All right. Bye. <laughs>